You are listening to Proof Text, a Glossa House podcast exploring the scripture and all things related to it. New episodes are released daily. For more information, check out glossahouse.com and subscribe to our channels on Spotify and YouTube. Welcome and enjoy. Hello and welcome to another edition of Proselytize or Apostatize. I'm your host, David Russell, along with my new co-host, Nick Peters, because we had to kick David Palman out for all his heresies. <laughs> yeah, you're talking about when you say David Palman, you mean the uh, open fiesta to Calvinistic presuppositionist who doesn't affirm a virgin birth. That's the very affirm, one. Yeah. That is the very one, Nick. Uh, thanks for uh, for hosting this with me. I am just kidding, guys. Nick is actually participating in today because we have a very special show. It is Autism Awareness Month, and Nick kind of yep. like said, hey, you should do something for that. And I was like, hey, let's do something for that. And I was like, hey, I know the perfect guest that would come in because you guys kind of like talked about the same thing at one time, and it just clicked in my mind that I should have you both on and talk about uh, how autism affects faith. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I was like, this is this is going to be a, a good example for PRA to kind of honor the month as well. And we had actually another debate scheduled, but I think the Lord worked it out to where this one got, like, got pushed in its spot. So I was really excited that it all worked out. So welcome, mm -hmm. Nick Peters who is from Deeper Waters, and I'll let him plug his own channel as I put his website up on the screen. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Nick. Yeah, my website is Deeper Waters Apologetics, where we do apologetics very seriously, going deeper than other sites. We've got a strong emphasis on discipleship, and we also reach out to the disabled community especially if I was on the uh, autism spectrum. One of my favorite talks I've given, I've even given it to Bill Craig's class before, is the topic, Is the Disabled My Neighbor? And Autism Awareness Month is a very special month for me. I, I wish more people knew more about it and would do a lot more for it, but you can find me at deeperwatersapologetics.com. And if you like what you hear, I've got Patreon, and of course, I affirm the virgin birth. <laughs> right on. Well, the next guest is Aaron Burnett. Both of these guys are no strangers to the show, so you all have seen them before. But Aaron, why don't you just uh, tell us a little bit about who you are and what you're up to? Hello, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Aaron Burnett. I'm a theology postgrad student. I'm from Ireland, but I live in Scotland. In terms of how I view the faith, that has changed a lot over the years. So I started off, well, I started off in a fairly mainline home. Then I went very fundamentalist. And then when I was at theological college, as quite often happens, I came out the other side and agnostic. So that is a brief overview of where I'm coming from. And, of, and I'm also on the autism spectrum, of course, mm -hmm. highly relevant. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right, right. Well, guys, it's wonderful to have both of you here. You know, I love these conversations. I love having conversations with with all you guys, man. Everybody's been so gracious coming on here. Uh, we got Hugh Ross next week, uh, which is going to be fun. We're going to be talking about climate change, the big debate. And he's on the spectrum as well. Yeah. So, you know, that's that's really cool. You know, I had forgotten about that when I actually arranged it. So when you reminded me, I was like, this is really cool. So everything just worked out perfectly this month for this discussion and having Hugh on. But, you know, Reasons to Believe is really, really they work with you really well. I don't think mm -hmm. I've ever, ever had a, a ministry that that just is all excited and all about the people, you know, they just oh, yeah. do whatever, man. So, mm -hmm. but yeah, so guys, you know, I put together a list of five questions, but my, my hopes here were you guys also to explain uh, the spectrum and, 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 you know, whatever you wanted to air out here. And, and I did bring you together for a purpose because I want to know how autism affects faith. So, I'll let uh, I'll 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 pose my first question and let you guys kind of both answer that how it affects faith and then answer that specific question because it kind of ties in. I think all these kind of tie in. But Nick, in a recent article, you said that you suspect for those on the spectrum, it is harder to walk with God, or the mm. walk is harder with God. So if you could just get into that, and then you guys can like 
don't feel free to push back on each other too because i know you guys it, it's funny because both of you guys came out of this on the other side nick is an yeah. ardent theist and aaron's like i'm an agnostic so i just want to know how that relates and i know both of you talked about the census divinitatis uh both mm -hmm. of you guys don't have that that feeling you know yeah. that, that notion so uh yeah let's just get into that and and uh um tell the audience what it's all about well i think well first off i want to know i do still affirm the virgin birth but yes. secondly I, I think part of the thing is that it could be we don't christianity isn't so hard so much as western christianity is hard and i think that needs to be a distinction because western christianity is so very individualistic <clears throat> i mean when i go to christians and we're talking about getting advice on personal matters and i say well what do you think god is leading you to do i'm sorry i don't see this language in scripture and i don't see anything that says give my feelings divine authority i remember going to a church once and having the pastor when the offer came and said well you go ahead and just give as you feel led every now and then i was so tempted to come up to the front and announce i was putting in just a penny and saying this is what i felt led to do can't argue against it can you and I, I think when we point to emotions as a connection between God and people, those of us on the spectrum who can struggle with them, that's very difficult to have. And a lot of people being on the spectrum will get confused if we use language that we understand the church, but a lot of people outside don't. If you ask someone on the spectrum, well, tell me, are you washed in the blood? They are going to get a very different picture than the one you really want to. And the final thing I think I talk about, actually the next last thing, I think evangelism can be difficult for us to do because, you know, you have to go up and talk to strangers. <laughs> that, that is so true. I would rather talk to a crowd of 100 people than talk to one. And I suspect Aaron could even feel, yep, she's the exact same way. And finally, prayer can be extremely difficult, I find. And after all, I have a hard enough time talking to one person I can see right in front of me. How do you talk to God who you can't see right in front of you? And that, that, that makes me thankful for the incarnation, but it can be a struggle. It doesn't mean it's not without its benefits, but yes, it can be a struggle. And I from a virgin birth. <laughs> Go ahead, Erin. You're up. Okay. So how autism affects faith? First of all, I echo everything Nick said, and I emphasize with everything he said. I've been through that. Yes, the the very familial language that churches tend to use when talking about the, the relationship between someone and God or Jesus. Yes, it just, it never worked for me. And I remember sitting thinking, these songs sound like you're singing to your girlfriend rather than you're singing to the Lord of the universe. <laughs> um, so I, I decided to, then to do my undergraduate dissertation on autism and theology because I wanted to look into it a bit deeper and see if anyone else feels this way. And it turns out, yes, lots of people do. And I found some particularly interesting studies that I'll try and summarize. Mm -hmm. So there is one from 2012, the University of British Columbia, that they found whenever autistic people talk about God as a whole, they tend to be more talking about a concept than a person. So for mm -hmm. example, the arch heretic, John Shelby Spong, he <laughs> often refers to God basically as an anthropomorphized version of goodwill. Quite heretical, but that's the sort of thing that this study was talking about. It's not mm -hmm. thinking of God as a being which we can directly relate to, it's something a bit more vague. Mm -hmm. Another even more interesting study from the University of Boston found that autistic people on the whole are way more likely to identify as atheists than the general population. Mm -hmm. And that course doesn't mean that all atheists are artistic or that all autistic people must be atheist it just means there's a much higher prevalence and there's various reasons for that some of it is because we tend to think very logically and that can sometimes preclude 
supernatural explanations. And another reason is, just as Nick said, it can be the social disability. As he said, it's hard enough to relate to a person who's right in front of you. It makes it even more harder to relate to someone who you can't actually see. But I will say, just to finish off before I ramble too much in this answer, I do think I am closer to God now than I was the last time I appeared on this show, which will probably make David quite happy. Um, mm -hmm. I've just been, yes, putting in a lot of effort, I suppose, in trying to get close to God in a way that works for me as an autistic person, rather than mm -hmm. forcing myself into the Western ways that Nick described, which just weren't no. working and pushed me right into agnosticism. So I will finish on that somewhat positive note. <laughs> right on. So, so you're giving up your agnostic ways then, I see. <laughs> I'm still an agnostic. I just think if, you, if, it was a, if it was a big scale, I'm slightly towards the theist side. <laughs> oh, very good. Very good. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm glad when you said the arch heretic, you explained you meant John Shelby Spong, because I thought you were talking about David Pauman. Yeah. No, yeah. I think Spong that's is the way first, more radical than Pauman. That's the, that's the first person that came to my head, too. Um, and, you know, that, that's and, also and say the main reason is, is because, you know, when you actually need him, he's absent. You see, I mean, he just doesn't show up, you know. You know let, let, let's also say that something else that can be difficult about church and i'm so glad but it looks like covid cured this in most churches is thank god we don't have greeting time anymore oh, at churches uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's coming and back from man, the virgin no, birth it's gonna come back though nick so you gotta get ready oh, um, <laughs> um yeah so like i just want to know uh, and you aaron obviously you fell prey to the ideas that you know, the atheism and you tend to lean more agnostic and stuff. So like, I want to know, like, what was it for you, Nick, that sealed the deal to say, Hey, I believe this regardless of not feeling this mm -hmm. divinity, you know, census divinitatis or, or, you know, what was it for you that tipped you into the theist direction? If Aaron, what Aaron says is true on Wait, the thing. No. It's pretty interesting. Whenever I am caught up in a wave of emotion, and I'm sure Erin knows when that happens to her as well. When you get away for me, that's when I start having doubts about things. When I start becoming rational again, moving out of that, that's when my logic kicks in. I say, "Yeah, this makes sense." And I mean, for me, the arguments today that work the most are the Thomistic arguments for God's existence. I find those extremely persuasive. Uh, it's not one of his main arguments. You could tie it to the fourth way, though. I find the idea of beauty extremely powerful as a pointer to God. I, mean, I, I think there are some things in this world that are so beautiful that I think, yeah, there's got to be something behind that. And when I look at uh, Jesus, I mean, it's interesting that she mentioned the arch heretic. John Shelby Spong, not David Pauman, just to clarify, but uh, I'm actually reading John Shelby Spong right now because I'm doing an ebook series. I'm going to be writing one, and the first one is going to be about the uh, virgin birth, which I do affirm. And John Shelby Spong has a book, Born of Woman, and I, I keep going through and I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I don't know why Spong's Jesus got crucified. I don't see that happening. And I, I think the same thing happened with John Dominic Cross. And I read him several years ago in the book, Five Views on a Historical Jesus, where he talks about how Jesus moved away from what John the Baptist said and was more about the brotherhood of man, love for your fellow neighbor. And I'm left here thinking, this kind of Jesus doesn't get crucified. You don't crucify Mr. Rogers going around sending a feel-good message. And so I look at the life of Jesus, how unique an individual he is. Uh, Tom Gilson has an interesting book on this also, Too Good to Be False, that we couldn't create a Jesus if we wanted to. And then I look at the evidence for the resurrection, and a resurrection really changes everything. If it's true, evil will be conquered, there is a purpose to everything, life has meaning, etc. If it isn't, Eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. And I from a virgin birth. Right so uh, go ahead, uh, Aaron. You got anything on that? 
Yes, well, to go back to the theologians like Spong and Crossan, mm -hmm. on one hand, I do credit them with keeping me in the church. I think if it wasn't for <laughs> theologies like that, I probably would have walked away entirely. However, I did, yes, like Nick, come to a point where I was reading them and thinking, well, what, what is the point? It basically boils <laughs> Christianity down to be a nice person. And it's like, mm -hmm. well, I can be a nice person without being Christian. So what makes it Christian? And I think that's when I sort of got to the end of my rope with the really progressive theologies, because at the end of the day, it just became... It was nothing more than humanism with a few Christian yeah. words sprinkled in. <laughs> but the yes, other early Christians were thrown to the lions for being nice people. <laughs> yes, but this is to derail the conversation somewhat from autism. Yeah, yeah well, it's fine. I mean, you know, it all comes down to like how it affected your faith anyway. So, I, mm. I, you know, I'm prepared to go down these type of trails too. I mean, I, I'm really trying to make this about you guys and, and about Autism Awareness Month. So, uh, um, I heard you guys both say some stuff, uh, and and Nick, I, I think I even read it uh, in some of your your blogs that you've been posting. By the way, Nick's been posting a lot of uh, autism awareness month mm -hmm. blogs and stuff. So if you guys like it, like this type of stuff, and you want to be more aware, go check out Nick's uh, blog. So uh, yeah, just throwing a in a little uh, what what do they call that a snippet. Yeah, for you there. Um, you said, why are relationships so hard for for autistic people? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, because, uh, of course, you know, you understand, you know, it's a spectrum and there's the yeah. extreme and then there's the Asperger's and mm -hmm. stuff like that. There is that. Um, why is it so hard for for mm -hmm. autistic people in relationships? Well, first off, I affirm a virgin birth. And second, uh, but like David <laughs> Coleman, yes, the open theistic Calvinistic presuppositions who doesn't affirm a virgin birth, which I do affirm. But before I did the show today, I went out in the town some because a church in the area was working together. Several other communities have a nine mile yard sale, so I went out looking for so many different deers. You know, I could find didn't find much. Oh, I did find Bart Ehrman's book Forged for a dollar somewhere, so I snatched that one up right quick. But one thing I notice is whenever I go up this place, a person's house, and they always say, how are you? I cringe every time I get that question. I hate it so much because it's either if I tell you how I really am and it's not something you want to hear, you're going to want to cut off communication anyway. I mean, I really wish people would stop asking. And if I'm not in a good mood, do you think I want a question that reminds me I'm not in a good mood? The relationships are hard because there are so many unwritten rules that we don't understand, or maybe we do understand them, and they make no sense whatsoever to us. I mean, the whole, how are you thing? That to me is just, I know you're trying to be nice with that, but it makes no sense to me. I mean, why not just ask, say something like, good to see you, welcome, hello. I would appreciate all of those a whole lot more. And I, I think if you want to see the way that relationships can be difficult, I, I know the producers say he's not on the spectrum, but I keep continuing that he is. Watch Sheldon Cooper on The Big Bang Theory and see how he does with his relationships. So many things that he says about them, they make perfect sense to me, and I affirm the virgin birth. That's your cue whenever he says I affirm the virgin birth, Aaron. <laughs> okay, so I'll start by saying I'm not sure if I affirm the virgin birth. <laughs> and then to go to the question, which is why, why do we find socializing difficult? Well, I think a good way we perhaps compare it to other disabilities. So someone mm -hmm. say without legs or without fully functioning legs will find yeah. it difficult or impossible to walk. In the same way, someone with autism will find it difficult or impossible to communicate. Yeah. But because it's an invisible disability, it's not immediately obvious. Mm -hmm. And 
yeah, I, I agree with Nick that a lot of it is there's just so many social rules that for most neurotypicals or non-autistic people mm. are just intuitive. For us, yeah, they don't come naturally and it's very confusing. Particularly, so I went to an all girls school. So, can you imagine the amount of social rules amongst 800 girls? Oh, Absolute man. nightmare. Oh, God. Wow. It's no wonder I didn't have any friends. No wonder but, you're an agnostic, huh? <laughs> <laughs> but on a more positive note, this is probably because I'm on the Asperger's end as opposed to the more profound end, but socialization yeah. can be learned. And it, it, yes, it is it a can. skill that you can certainly develop and get better at throughout the years. Mm. And for mm -hmm. me, actually, church was a big part of that because ideally, church communities should be somewhere non judgmental where you can mm -hmm. learn these skills, where mm -hmm. you can be an absolute idiot and mess up lots of times, but they should mm -hmm. encourage you. Unlike a school full of 800 girls where if you do something wrong, mm -hmm. you're ostracized. <laughs> yeah. Right on. Right on. Yeah. I, oh. I've found that whenever I go to churches, I have to be very careful if I'm in a small group setting. Because if you ask a question about the Bible, I'm usually prone to jump in and I could go on and on and on and on and on. And then you have a whole SpongeBob thing two hours later, on and on and on. I mean, I recently met with my pastor. I started. Oh, dear. Is that his end? That's on his end. These servers go. Okay. Uh, oh, Nick, you, got, okay. you froze up. Okay. That. Well, anyway, I met with my new pastor recently, and one of the things I said to him right at the start is, I want you to know I am in a project, but I'm not gunning for your job. He said, I know, never had any fears about that, because I think that can be an honest fear when I go to a church, because a lot of pastors, I think, do want to defend their own purpose and fear anyone who might know something else about the subject. But yeah, I have to be very careful in a small group setting because if i don't i will tend to dominate the conversation and i from a virgin birth <clears throat> aaron anything else on that any stories hmm, besides to... besides your you know i'm not putting you on the spot or anything so it, i can explain this is like okay so nick you come at it like you you know it, it really it unnerves you for people to say how you doing or whatever like yeah. that so so you know like for people like me that always that's that's a that's a standard greeting for us you know so it's like saying yeah. hello it's not like you don't even have to you can be like i'm feeling like crap you know <laughs> or yeah. like yeah. like i affirm the virgin birth even though i don't want to today and i haven't had my first yeah. cup of coffee you know you know so for me it's like it's just standard you know so like it's like saying hello and yeah. You know, so it's good that, that you raise that awareness to be more careful when you're actually dealing with a, uh, a person that has autism to maybe change the approach. And is, yeah. that, is that something that, that we should do and be aware of and um, make that exception, you know? Yeah, and I, I think another thing to be cautious of is, well, I'm thinking about two different things right now. One is touch. I would be extremely cautious if you know someone's on the spectrum with any kind of touch. Because a lot of us, even if it's from someone we know and trust, if we get touched, we don't really like it. I mean, I've got a steel rod on my spine, actually, which makes a touch on my back to be doubly sensitive for me. And another thing that's really difficult for me on the spectrum is when I'm in social settings involving food. Those are usually very difficult for me because my diet is so finicky. And if I see a dirty plate with a single crumb on it, I'm reacting the same way Clark Kent does to kryptonite. <laughs> if, you, if, if you watch Smallville and you saw yeah. the way Clark Kent yeah. responded to kryptonite, that's yeah. the exact yeah. same way I respond. And so it, it's very difficult when I'm in a setting and that's what's going on and everyone's doing and everyone's having a meal and I'm sitting there thinking I'm on the outside of it all. I mean, honestly, growing up, when I heard in the Bible about the wedding supper of the lamb, that was really a turnoff for me. I was kind of thinking, yeah, can I just sit off in the corner or somewhere or something when I get there? So what do you do in communion, man? <laughs> well, that's only a little bit and it's done 
privately right. in your pew, which honestly I don't think is very really biblical. I, I think our communion is way too individualistic. I think communion was meant to be a full meal of a church mm-hmm. shared together. And if I had to, I'd go through with it. I mean, honestly, I'm on this, since I'm on the spectrum, I'm also terrified of water. Being baptized was a huge issue for, for me when it happened, which I finally did. And uh, I was, my mother was there and she told the pastor, I said, look, he's got a steel rod on his back, which he knew, and he's terrified of water, which he knew. Take him under the bare minimum. And that's what they did. <laughs> yeah. And I have from the virgin birth. So why do you think that – okay, so here's oh, – Aaron, go ahead. Did you have anything on that? I, I was I just going to say I think this proves how even people with the same condition can present quite differently, which is why it's important to get to know their individual needs. Right. So for me, I agree with Nick on touch, uh, particularly if it's unexpected. That could be a nightmare. Mm-hmm. Particularly – so. I'm in quite a high church tradition. So, you know, we share the peace, which is sometimes a handshake or sometimes people just bring a hug on you. (laughs) Things like that can be challenging. But then on the other hand, I don't have any issues with food at all. In fact, I'm quite famous for eating anything that's in front of me. So, yeah, it just goes to show that every autistic person is different. (laughs) The rule is when you you meet one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. Yeah, you, and I from a virgin birth. It's kind of funny that you say that because you know you're describing things that would also de- people would deal with that aren't on the spectrum. I have friends but, that are on the spectrum that hate mm, to be touched, but I yeah. have some friends on, on that are on the spectrum that love to be hugged. You know, I also have mm. people that like bald guys. They don't like you to rub their head sometimes. It makes them feel <laughs> like Buddha. You know, so. It's like you're telling them they're fat or something. They get really offended. And then you're talking about like I, I know people that aren't on the spectrum that that have OCD. Like if it, like you said with mm-hmm. the crumb on the yeah. plate, you know, it's like yeah. kryptonite. There's some people that you know. Uh, my wife has it in, to a degree. She gets she can't have like parts of her her food touching. But it gets so crazy that like there are some foods that have to be mixed. You know, so it's like, I don't know where to go with her. It's like, I can't make this because you don't like this touching it, but then you're going to, you know, make a taco bowl with all this. Stuff in it, you know, so, Adrian Monk was incredibly rational in so many ways. And I from a virgin birth. So it's kind of funny though, too, is because, you know, I, I feel bad for Erin because I just brought her on with two Thomas. Uh, the last debate she did on PRA was with uh, uh, Swan Sona, who is a uh, uh, a Catholic uh, Thomist. So it's uh, it's kind of funny. So maybe if you study Thomism, you'll you'll even drift closer from agnosticism to Christianity. Well, I, I actually tutor Thomism because that's part of our high school specification. So I tutor it, but that's obviously very different to actually believing it. But yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so I actually well- have a theory that Thomas Aquinas was on the spectrum as well. Oh, probably. I think almost every prolific theologian is or was. I mean, you have to be to be that obsessed with theology. Uh, and there was a story that Thomas Aquinas was at this party and everyone around him is talking, shouting, all these things. He's just sitting there just thinking. And all of a sudden, bam, he brings his fist down the table and says, and that will settle the manichees. <laughs> and everyone freezes immediately. And the king is sitting there and says, whatever he says, write it down. But that, that's, that to me sounds like a very aspy thing to do, to have, this whole part going around, you're not paying any attention, and all of a sudden you slam your fist down and you're in your own world. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah, you know, I, I but I do it too. I'm not on the spectrum. Mm-hmm. That that is, but like I, I get oh, maybe you are. Maybe I am. Maybe <laughs> one of us. Maybe we're all one just one of and us. don't know about it. No, just, <laughs> we do have uh, everybody else. There's something wrong with everybody else. That's what that's yeah. the issue. You know? mm-hmm. <laughs> um so I'm I'm kind of I'm kind of wondering here because you know you guys are on such different sides and you did say autism affected that so I want to know even more so now that like you know Aaron what is it about autism that drifts you towards 
agnosticism more than Christianity? And it is it just the census divinitatis? It's partially the census divinitatis. It's also that I tend to be very empirical to a fault. Mm. So, for example, take the resurrection. You know, obviously I've got a theology degree and I'm doing my second one. So I'm well familiar with the arguments on both sides. The only thing is, at the end of the day, I wasn't there. I didn't see it. I think the whole idea of faith is perhaps quite difficult for me because I don't know how I can say, yes, this thing definitely happened when I wasn't there, which is probably why I would be a horrendous Christian. But now some of the verses I really like are the ones, for example, Christ is all and is in all. So I feel like even though I cannot be certain about all these historical facts, I feel like I can almost experience Christ and his love through my relationship with other people. I think for me, that's definitely the primary way in which I would say I experience God. It's through connection with other people or with the created world. Do I though affirm every line of the Nicene Creed? I am not sure. And that is because I cannot empirically verify any of them. Yeah, but you, you know what's funny though is that you know, and and Nick, you can you can counter on this too. Uh, you're, you're talking about empiricism and evidence and stuff like that, but what about all the evidence? At the end of the day, is it just sight, or because I know science? You know, we believe things in science that we can't see. We believe things in in uh, nature that we definitely can't say I was there, but we believe they happened, like uh, historical things like War II example. I didn't live in that time, you know, I, but I, I'm pretty sure the, the videos are authentic and the, uh, you know, I go to Hiroshima and the, and the, the radiation levels are still high, you know? So, I mean, it, what about all the evidence that could lead you to that conclusion? Why don't they get you there? And does autism actually affect that? Does, is that, is that part of it? I think for me, still, the evidence on the other side just seems more convincing. I think it's po it's partially Occam's razor in that whatever is the simplest you go for. I think the argument that it was basically a post-bereavement post hallucination that went very far is probably the most likely explanation because it doesn't require the supernatural and it's a well-documented phenomenon. On the other hand, it could well have been a supernatural phenomenon. I just... Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Nick, you got anything on that? Yeah, it, it, it's so amazing. So many times that Aaron and I seem to say that our faith, our position is driven by autism and the exact opposite means. Like she says, well, because of my autism, the empirical cause, so that leads me to doubt. And I'd say, well, because of my being on the spectrum, I'm extremely empirical, which leads me to believe. <laughs> it, yeah. It's. It's very different that way, and like when she says the term supernatural, that is one time where I, <clears throat> I do want to start giving pushback. Some cars, I don't use that term. Even when I'm <clears throat> online, I'm debating atheists, and they start bringing up, where well, you hold us something supernatural. I would say, okay, can you tell me what that means? How do you define that term? I usually don't get a good definition. I, I think it's a modern humanist false notion we've got up. I prefer to say something is either a material or extra material. And we all hold to extra material realities. And coming from a Thomistic perspective, <clears throat> even existence itself is extra material. I mean, I can look around here and I see several things that exist. Books, this water jar I've been drinking from, both of you, my cat on the bed, everything. These exist, but if, I, but if I said to you, okay, I know there are some things that exist, but can you just bring me like a jar of just existence itself? That's all I want. Well, no, you can't do that. You can't just say, okay, here, here, take a handful of existence. It doesn't work that way. Or we could talk about things like, say, exactly. trying, or talk about things like triangularity, or some people could say numbers exist, or good and evil and those i mean I, I think they definitely exist and i think god makes sense of those and i i i really just don't use the term supernatural 
for that reason. And as for the evidence, you know, I, I don't find the hallucination things convincing because usually after a person has a hallucination, they know they've had a hallucination and they don't really base their whole lives on it. The only exceptions are people who are in the cases of extreme dementia. My aunt passed away a couple of years ago. She was in her 90s where she was convinced she had four cats in her house. She only had one. You could not convince her otherwise. But I don't think anyone would say the disciples were in that kind of state where they were out of their mind in a permanent sense. My aunt was getting that way, as we saw the evidence of. So I, I think that works to me. So, and, you know, when you talk about how we weren't there, well, yeah, but unfortunately, I like that. I think that's the same thing Ken Ham, for instance, says with his arguments. And I don't find that convincing at all. So I'd say, actually, I believe in Christianity and the resurrection of Jesus because I'm on the spectrum and my emotions don't cloud me. Like I think they can for a lot of people, unfortunately. And I just go with just the data and I get, look at the data. I see God is real and Jesus is who he said he was and he rose from the dead. And I'm from a virgin birth. <laughs> all right, uh, Aaron? You got any pushback on that? I suppose I would say, how do you know the Bible's testimony that Jesus rose from the dead is more credible, say, than the Quran's testimony that he was taken down from the cross before he actually died? Or how how then do you know that, say, the miracles and the... Sorry, I'm going to pronounce this wrong. It's the Hindu holy book. I'm not even going to try and pronounce it. Yeah. That one, yeah. yes. How can you be so sure that the biblical events are true, but the events, say, in the Quran or the Hindu book are not? <laughs> okay. Well, those are good questions. First off, just saying X event in the Bible is true doesn't mean Y, Z event outside the Bible isn't true. I am fully open to the possibility of miracles in other religions taking place. I would say that could be A, God giving a bit of grace to someone, or B, demonic activity going place, a pseudo-miracle. Both of those would be fine to me. It could be that Muhammad really did have this strange experience, and yet Jesus rose from the dead. Now, I, I think the Quran is definitely wrong on the idea that Jesus survived the crucifixion. I think historical scholarship has really got that taken care of. It. It's interesting. It's a Christian argument I've read that says that the Quran might not even really be arguing that. It could be arguing that the Jews were saying, hey, we killed Jesus. We killed Jesus. And Allah and the Quran saying, no, you didn't kill Jesus. I was in charge of the whole thing there. So it could be that Muhammad wasn't really denying the crucifixion, but that's what happened later on. You know, with the Bhagavad Gita, and I was, I'd look and say, okay, when did the events occur? When is the recording of the event? How, what kind of testimony do we have? Because I think we can all agree with the data for the resurrection. It is extremely early. That creed that we've got, Within five years, that is a very quick time for things to happen. So I'd say the resurrection, I think, just has a whole lot more historical data. But I think we need to approach our miracle claims the same way. I think one of the mistakes I think so many historians in New Testament scholarship do is they kind of rule out miracles right at the start. Like Bart Ehrman says, a miracle by definition is the least likely event. Where if you say that, then what you are saying also is no amount of evidence can change that a miracle is the least likely event. Which leads me to think your belief in really isn't based on evidence. If you were out miracles at the start, but a miracle is what happened, you've ruled out the truth right at the start. Be open to a miracle. So on that point, I think I would agree with David Hume, you know, the Scottish philosopher, that for him to believe in a miracle, he said, its non-occurrence would have had to be more miraculous than its occurrence. 
Um, so he's not necessarily writing it out. He's just applying Ockham's razor and saying it is by definition extremely unlikely. But overall, I, I really like your answer, actually. Yeah. It's a lot less arrogant, I think, than a lot of Christian answers, which is to basically say they're all wrong and we're definitely right. So no, yeah. I definitely I appreciated the nuance in your yeah. answer. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I'm definitely right with Christianity, but that doesn't mean all the other religions are definitely wrong. There are some great truths that can be found in other religions. And as for Hume, Hume got a lot of pushback in his day because he, he was told, imagine a tropical nation out there somewhere that's never seen a cold climate at all. And you go to them and you tell them about ice, water being in a frozen state. And they say, look, we, we live in water, we're surrounded by water all day, water does not freeze, that is totally outside of our experience. And actually, an agnostic wrote a great book responding to Hume called Hume's Abject Failure, John Earman wrote it. He said, if we follow Hume's argument on miracles, we will also cure science as well. Interesting. Interesting. Because I and consider... I remember, just to say, I consider my arguably extreme empiricism to be a deficit. Like, I don't think it's something to be celebrated. It's the, probably the one thing that's holding me back, but at the same time, it's not like I can really do anything about it. So, yes, I think I just don't understand how you can just have faith. I, it just does not compute. I don't understand how you can just have faith, how you can just like flip a switch and believe something. But <laughs> well, well, I'm not saying either that I flip a switch and believe something. I think a lot of Christians use the term faith very badly. Faith doesn't mean just, I believe willy nearly regardless of any evidence or lack thereof. No one should do that. Faith in the New Testament world is really trust in what has been shown to be reliable. And if you think the arguments for God uh, are very reliable, they work very well, and if you think the arguments for resurrection are good, you trust them. You should. I mean, to go back to my own fears earlier that I pointed out, and this is where your emotion can cloud you, at least for me in this case, is that I could read all the books in the world, I'm sure, on water and buoyancy and how things float, and then go, yep, yep, I agree with all that. It makes perfect sense. Put me in a swimming pool, it will not make perfect sense anymore. It makes sense on a rational level, but my emotions are going to go against me and say, if I move away from the edge, I will trip and I will die immediately. And die from the virgin birth. <laughs> so say on my scale of theism mm. to agnosticism, atheism, mm. in order to properly call myself a Christian, would you say I would have to be 100% certain in say things like the resurrection and all that, or what percentage can I hit and I can call myself a Christian in good faith? Honestly, I think if you could say more likely than not, I mm. think you could be getting there. I mean, I, can, I, can, I, can, I, I well think, could say that. Yeah, I think a healthy faith allows for doubts. In fact, I'll go further. A healthy faith requires doubts. If I meet a Christian who has never doubted their faith, I have just met a Christian who is not taking it seriously. The atheists on the internet are taking it more seriously than this Christian is. All Christianity should allow room to question, to doubt, and by God, it is one of the stupidest things we do when we have young people coming to our church and they start asking questions, and we tell them, be quiet, just have faith. That is one of the worst things you should do. If you don't know the answer to a question, I'd say even, hey, it's a good question. Let's go explore it together and find the answer together. We should always be welcoming of questions and doubts. And I have from a virgin birth. Anything else, Aaron, on that? I don't think so on this particular topic. Okay, are you are you ready to say the sinner's prayer now? Honest guys, like like what what you guys are both talking about. I mean, it hits home with me. I I struggle with apathy so that keeps me yeah. away that makes me not want to pray that makes me not yeah. want to do anything i mean apathy is probably my biggest issue and there are two great really evils there are two great evils in the world apathy and ignorance i don't know which one's worse for when i don't care 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you know, for Aaron though, I mean, if, if she's ready, I can talk to my tap here. We can start playing just as I am on there. We have a few hundred <laughs> choruses. <laughs> but yeah, Aaron, and, and you know, that's why I'm on SNS because I have to be knocked around and pushed by the skeptics so I can actually see where yeah. they're coming from and actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh look into things that you know i'm the type of person too that like i study something i really study it mm -hmm. and i'll i'll spend so much time on it but then i'll i'll be like okay i'm done with this study i, I you know i got my answer because i doubt yeah. you know, i have doubts too and mm -hmm. i get my answer i move on to another subject and yeah. then verbatim somebody comes and asks me the question about the subject i just studied the previous study and i have forgotten it <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have the big problem with retention too. So like, uh, I have to be in the study because I'm also afraid to misspeak. Cause you know, I mean, we were talking about fears and stuff like that too, a little bit, uh, not liking to get touched and, and certain things that trigger you and, and certain fears that, that you have maybe of water or, or whatever. Uh, but like for me, you know, my biggest fear is to misspeak, mm. you know, not represent something well. So that can also hold me back. So, I mean, everybody has their issues in that mm -hmm. as well. And, you know, it, it goes long to say, I think it's good that we, we kind of flush those out, you know, and we, we, we are able to talk about them, which is yeah. really cool. I was glad that you guys actually did that. And, and mm -hmm. there is one thing is like, I wanted to know, and this is before I, I, I want to open the floor up to you guys just to start talking about what's important to you about autism in this month and stuff like that and what we should be aware of. Uh, I know Nick already said a couple things, but and Aaron has said a couple things. But it, uh, if there's anything else you guys want to bring out, I know like Nick, you've been writing papers galore about Autism Awareness Month and stuff like that. So anything you want to share on that end? And this is what I was talking about when I said you'll have to help me a little bit in the show <laughs> too, so to, mm -hmm. to bring stuff that I wouldn't think of. Yeah. So um, uh, yeah. So what is it with the touching that bothers you the most? What is it in your mind that clicks that, that makes it appalling even? And I, would, do you think, did that affect you in your, in your other relationships? I don't really know. The only person who I've ever had extreme comfortableness with, with touch was Allie. And that was it. And I remember that sometimes if I'm, I'm touched, it just seems like a sudden intrusion on me. And you know, I've said before, I'm a gamer. Okay, I play video games a lot. And you can re remember that in many games, when you get touched, it counts as damage being given to <laughs> you. And I, I can sometimes think, I've been touched. How many hit points have I lost here? I mean, it, it's that kind of thinking going on it, it's just rather intrusive now if someone comes to me and they hold out their hand and i'm supposed to shake it okay i know it's coming i can handle that but if i just get a sudden touch something it's like i'm not prepared for this i'm not aware of this and my body to me is extremely personal uh, and something that i didn't even get to do with me and i i don't know why it is but you know, Aaron has this, one of the same conditions I do this, we both wear glasses. And <laughs> I absolutely hate it if someone takes off my own glasses. Oh, that's just there. rude. <laughs> yeah. I, I, if someone wants to go, wanted to help me and even clean my glasses and they come over and say, no, no, I am taking them off. You can <laughs> take them in. And they don't put them on me. I say, no, you give it to me. I put them on myself i mean for me that is one of the worst kinds of things i have going on is that it I, i'm just so extremely finicky or if you just get a little finger and point at something like if my mother wanted to point out something on my face for instance she put her, her finger there that to me would just irritate me greatly it, it just I, I, it, it's one of those things that when you're on the spectrum you can't always explain why it makes sense, but it is. I often say autism is an explanation. It's not a justification. And I affirm the virgin birth. Right on. Aaron? Yeah, I think the best way to describe sensory differences is that 
For whatever neurological reason, autistic people experience the five senses much more intensely than neurotypicals. Mm -hmm. yeah. Of course, I've never been neurotypical, so it's not like I can compare, but mm -hmm. I think sound is my main thing. So I would need earplugs and ear defenders much, much more often than a quote unquote yeah. normal person. I think it's just because for whatever reason, we receive the same stimuli much more intensely. Mm -hmm. hmm. That's interesting. Um, yeah, so like I hear you guys on, on like the glasses part because you know I wear glasses too, you know, but I got my contacts in right now. But my I couldn't kid, do contacts at all. Me neither. Kid, I tried, I couldn't. My kid is notorious for taking my glasses off, so maybe that's something that you'll uh get used to if the child, if you have a child that takes your glasses off. Uh, my one year old is a pro at it, <laughs> but uh, mm. yeah, so I, I do want to open up the floor to you guys. And just, you know, spend five, five minutes or so each of you and, and tell me why uh, and how important this month is to you. And what are things that we could glean when even approaching an autistic person in trying, like, I made the mistake today and asked Nick, hey, what's up, man? You know, and did the whole, how you doing? You know, type thing, you know, so, yeah, so go into more of those type of things and, and give us some things that we should be aware of. I'll let you start, Nick. Well, I think that if you meet someone and they seem to be acting differently, they could be rude, maybe, but I wouldn't jump to that assumption. It could be they're like us. They're on the spectrum. And for me, if I don't know what to say to someone in a social situation, I don't say anything. That's usually the, the wisest thing to do in my mind at the time. Uh, if you want to be a friend to someone on the spectrum, get to know them, which we all want friends, even if we're on the spectrum. One thing to do is get to know their interests. And if you can connect with their interest, you could connect with them. And there was a time when Allie was talking about someone, talking to someone at church, and he was asking about me and said, well, he seems very off-putting. I don't know how to talk to him. And she said, well, sometimes you need to talk about apologetics. And he said, What's that? And she starts telling him. And I was across the room, and all of a sudden, I come running up. And I say, hey, did someone mention apologetics? And you could do the same if you came up to me and said, so, which Final Fantasy game is your favorite? Boom. Seven. My eyes are... What? Seven. Four. <laughs> but at least you've got good taste in games. But, yeah, if you dislike me, yeah, I'm going to jump in immediately and know what you're talking about. You talk to me about, say, Smallville, for instance. I'll be right there. You talk about our interest, and it also has to be genuine. We have to know that you really care about these things. We tend to be, I think, pretty good at finding fake people out there, mm -hmm. and we don't want to have anything to do with fake people. Now, this month means a lot to me also because we have so much political division in our country. We have things like, you know, Black History Month, Women's History Month, Asian American History Month, all these things. But I know it's Autism Awareness Month isn't really talked about that much. Because I suspect it's that we can't be used so well politically for any side to score political points. But we're real people out there. We're your neighbors. We're the people you work alongside the people you study with, the people who are your friends, the people you love and marry, even. We're out there. And for those in the church, don't write off the autistic community. Those of us on the spectrum can play a great role in Christianity. And you're having Hugh Ross on there. This guy founded his own international ministry on the spectrum entirely. And, you know, if you do get us to be a part of your world, we do become as loyal as dogs to you. Loyalty for me is extremely important. I, I think I would be very much at home in an Eastern culture that's very much honor shame based because that's the way I treat most of my relationships. You do me something good, I think at that point I am in your debt. I owe you something, I will repay that debt somehow. It's an honor thing for me. You do me a wrong, 
I will remember it. I can forgive you, but I'm likely to not treat the relationship the same way again without some serious work. So, yeah, I, I really hope the church opens its eyes to this month. I, I also remember a friend of mine who had a son who found it was on the spectrum, and he called me and said, what do you, what are you doing? He said, it was so sad, everyone else treated it like it was a cancer diagnosis or something. And I said, get on your knees and thank God right now. You are going to see the world for a whole new set of eyes, and it will never be the same again, and consider it a blessing. And that's what he really appreciated. And I affirm the virgin birth. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Aaron, you're up. Yeah, that was wonderful. Yes, I, I totally agree that if you want to connect with an autistic person, and I hope you do, then, oh, where's the video one? Oh, hello. <laughs> then yes, getting to know their interests is definitely a good place to start because most, if not all, autistic people have very intense-ish mm -hmm. interests. Yeah. See if I can find where. Mine is rabbits. Nowhere near mm. as high brow as apologetics. <laughs> so, yes. And the Apostle Paul described the church as like a human body. You need every single part to build God's kingdom. It may seem to the world that some parts are way more important than others, but actually, in God's eyes, it's the weakest that He actually makes the strongest. Mm -hmm. So you're, you include autistic people in your community, not only to make the autistic person whole, but to make your community whole. Everyone benefits. The autistic person benefits because they feel included and welcomed. The community benefits mm -hmm. because then they get to access that person's unique gifts. Mm -hmm. So I Very would well. also like to, I would also like to say about Autism Awareness Month that unfortunately, particularly if you get involved with you know, the autistic community online. There's an awful lot of debate over things like what language do we use? What symbols do we use, et cetera, et cetera. And the community can become really divided amongst itself. I don't know if you've seen this, Nick, but yeah, for example, the puzzle piece, I don't know why, but it's very controversial. So I see you've used the puzzle piece for this, for the, the symbol for this video. Sometimes that can cause massive fights online between people who like it and don't. And I would just like to say to both autistic people and neurotypical people, respect how other people want to express themselves mm -hmm. and express their autism. Focus more on what puts us together than what pulls us apart. <laughs> Right on. Unless you're David Paulman, who's a heretic. <laughs> you mean the open theistic Calvinistic presuppositions who yeah. doesn't affirm a virgin birth, which I do affirm? Right, that guy. I remember <laughs> some reason I'm suddenly tempted to start playing one winged angel right now. I'm not <laughs> sure why. <laughs> but all right. Well, guys, I mean we're we're at the conclusion here. I, I again thank you guys so much for uh enlightening me even more. Uh I think Nick, I, I read one of your articles. It's probably about uh, I would say about seven years now, and it was it was I guess it was during Autism Awareness Month because you had a, a a blog post on all how to approach an autistic person, and I uh, I used it with a, a guy at church and got to know him really well and ended up you know giving him rides here and there and and we became pretty close so you know this stuff does work uh, listen mm -hmm. uh, yep. to this and apply it you know mm -hmm. and just like you you want to change hearts for christ mm -hmm. one heart at a time you know learn the ways to get in touch and 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 know people um mm -hmm. as nick said you know even autistic friends they want to have friends too mm -hmm. so next time i i, I am going to go to an apologetics conference sometime and i'm sure i'm going to run into nick and i'm just going to raise my hands and say hey man uh so how is uh you know i'm going to ask like a final fantasy question or something so <laughs> yeah <laughs> i'm just kidding but yeah guys again thank you so much um i'll let you guys uh give any websites that you want to plug in right now and uh yeah so uh aaron i'll let you go first on this one and then i'll let you close that part nick okay my, my website is aaron burnett author.co.uk and it'll hopefully be in the description to see how you spell it um so yes I've, I've written one 
I've written a children's book so far, which is somewhat like Narnia. It's a fantasy book with a Christian message, but not as good as Narnia, but I, it, I still liked it. <laughs> and I'm currently writing a book about autism in the church, actually, which I hope will be out roughly the middle of this year, optimistically. So that's what I'm working on. And Nick? If it's, if it's any comfort, it'd be hard to talk Narnia. <laughs> yes. Uh, I, I like that we've had a great friendly discussion here. There's been pushback, there's been disagreements, but it's all ended on friendly terms. It's been great to get to spend time with Aaron here. I think we'd get along great. And I'd say for my end, my website is deeperwatersapologetics.com. I do have a Patreon there if anyone's interested in supporting. And I also have some ebooks. One I've written exclusively is a creed for the ages, the Apostles' Creed and today's Christian. <clears throat> I've taken part in books <clears throat> like um, Defining Inerrancy and Contextualizing Inerrancy and Christian Answers to This Generation's Questions and Groundless. But right now, I'm writing an ebook called I Affirm the Virgin Birth, doing a lot of reading for that one now. And I've decided I'm going to move on with that and make it a whole series. So it's going to be after that, probably something like, I affirm the life of Jesus, which would be responding to mythicism. And I affirm the crucifixion. I affirm the barrier. I affirm the resurrection. I affirm the rule of Jesus, which would be preterist eschatology, orthodox preterist eschatology. And then on from there, I could keep this whole pattern going, writing more and more books like this. And you can find me again <clears throat> at deeperwaterasaprojects.com. And I don't remember if I mentioned it or not, but I do affirm the virgin birth. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I expect signed copies of both books. So, uh, yes, yeah, send them my way. <laughs> um, okay, guys. Well, that's the end of the show today. I, I really appreciate everybody for being here. Again, we've got some pretty cool shows. We've got uh, Hugh Ross on next week, and we got a surprise next week, too. We got another discussion on Epicurean uh, Paradox and current events another so, uh, one geez there's one every time you turn around <laughs> uh just uh tune in next week subscribe to us on youtube uh again thanks everybody for being here have a great weekend interested in growing your ancient language skills but not sure where to start glows house can help from illustrated readers and short stories to lexicons and grammars Glossa House offers a variety of resources for beginning, intermediate, and experienced ancient language learners. Head to glossahouse.com today. Glossa House, language resources for the global community.